Hi everybody, welcome to Phoenix Fiction Writers Podcast episode 34, where it is our mission to create worlds out of birds. I'm Hannah Heath, the PFW Multimedia Manager, and I'm joined today by fellow PFW authors KL Plus Pierce and J.E. Perazzi. Um, so today we're going to be chatting about the importance of letting your passions and interests drive your writing, um, but before we get into that, let's do introductions. Hi, I'm Kayla Plus Pierce, also known as Kirsten. I'm the author of Two Lives, Three Choices, Through the Lens, and Guide Noid, and I am the blog coordinator for PFW. Yes. Um, and as mentioned, I'm Hannah Heath. I am a writer of YA Christian Speculative Fiction, author of The Torn Universe, which is an expanded universe of science fiction and fantasy short stories. And I am J.E. Prazzi, the author of the Malfunction Trilogy and several short stories, and the managing editor of PFW. So we're a little light on news this month, but one cool thing I really wanted to mention. Um, so if you've been following this podcast at all, you know that PFW has a coffee account where you can do one-time really small donations, like $3.00. Um, and it really helps uh, support us in our endeavors, and we always really appreciate that. Um, and in return for those donations, we do like to release fun little things on our coffee account. And this month, we have something really special. Uh, Grace Crandall, our resident artist here at PFW, has been making individual art pieces for each of the short stories in our anti-heroes anthology. Um, so one of those is going up each week on our coffee account, and they're so cool. Um, so we really recommend you going and checking that out. It's linked below. Go look at all the pretty pieces of art. Um, and then if you like them, and if you are able, we really appreciate a small one-time donation. It really helps us out. So, yay. Yeah, and then uh, the only other piece of news uh, that we have, I have a Discord channel for my readers group, and we do a lot of fun things on there, um, including exclusive content and all that kind of stuff. But one of the things that I like to do, because I have so many authors who are part of my Discord, is to do a writing spreads together every week. And then this coming month for NaNoWriMo, we are actually going to be doing those um, as a kind of live chat. So I'm going to be coming on Skype. We're going to have a sign-up form. You guys can come and hang out with me and some other authors on Skype. And we do two hours of writing on Tuesday evenings. So, yeah, go ahead and join us for that if you need some NaNoWriMo uh, encouragement. Yes. <laughs> all right. So that's linked below. So definitely check that out. Um, all right. So what is everybody up to this month, writing wise? How's it been going? Uh, I'm still in that never ending quest to get my second full novel published. <laughs> uh, so this month has been trying to get myself reorganized. So what I'm trying to do this month is get all my to edit list items in a mind map. So basically it's a diagram with at various points you can have images, links, or just text with to-do items, which I have a lot of, and just have them all kind of radiate around a central point. So it's kind of, which is getting the book published mm -hmm. and edited. And still working on it, but it is a good way for me to organize my thoughts since I'm I'm always this mix of either being really orderly and planning stuff out or being a total scatterbrain thinking of random ideas out of the blue. So um, so far, my mapping seems to be the best of both worlds. I'm going to start getting more items on the list and hopefully assigning deadlines to them, which will hopefully end at an actual published date for Two Lives, Two Destinies. Fingers crossed. Yes, we've been waiting, but we're happy to because we're excited. Um, I was curious, actually, that... Are you using a software for that map? Because that sounds really helpful, but also complicated. Or do you just like make it on your own? Uh, let's see. I have been using a software. I need to look. I think it's called MindMo. Oh. So there's a lot of different mind mapping tools out there. I found if you do a Google search for mind map software, there's a lot of options either for downloading or you can create an account on a website that you can do mind maps for. That's awesome. I asked them. I have seen templates for college, so if you ever wanted to try that out. Yeah. <laughs> I might have to. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, October has been insane for me, um, and it's gotten even more insane. So uh, I'm running a really big promotion this month because uh, I just finished up my um, Modern Gothic Horror Series. 
So uh, seeing as though it's October and I can take advantage of, you know, spoopy season, as they call it, <laughs> um, I've been doing a ton of stuff, including live streams every weekend, giveaways every week, um, art reveals, all the things. So that's been insane. Um, I've still been trying to squeeze in writing here and there, um, which has been interesting. But then that's made complicated because last week my family was in town to scatter my mom's ashes. And then this week my husband had a tooth infection. We had to go into the <laughs> no. ER. And so um, <laughs> anyways, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot. Because when I was looking at a healing, I'm like, oh, this is fine. I can still get stuff to now. <laughs> and then, you know, stuff comes up. Yeah. So I've basically been doing nothing the last two weeks. Um, and I'm trying to get back on my feet for this. But then also, uh, fun news. Um, I finally got through editing the uh, the audiobook for Malfunction. <laughs> so I'm looking at when I want to move forward on that project. Um, and hopefully that will be out soon. That's so exciting. Yeah. Um, let's see. So I, uh, nothing much new to report for me. I'm just, college is a lot. So I'm just snatching like five to 10 minutes here or there to write. Um, one thing that I've been struggling with is, um, because I'm only writing for five to 10 minutes at a time, it's hard to like immerse myself into the story. And by the time I get there, like I, the time has run out and then I just have to start the whole process over the next day. Um, so I've been trying to find music that helps get me in the mood for that story. Um, and I weirdly have found that Frank Sinatra <laughs> is working. And I have no idea why, because it's like this dark, my very poor pitch for this is it's like a sad, stabby boy wandering around in the rain, avoiding getting stabbed himself and trying to stab his enemies. Like, that's my sad pitch. So Frank Sinatra shouldn't really fit that, but he does somehow. And so that's been working. So just a little weird tip for y'all. If you're stuck, try Frank, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> Whatever works. Yeah. Yes. That's my weird writing story for the month. Um, but let's talk about um, letting our passions drive our writing. This is something that we kind of, we bring it up a lot in past podcasts, and it kind of comes up here and there in our blog and stuff. So I thought, let's let's dive into this. Um, so why do we think it's important to let our personal interests and passions drive our writing? Uh, so one thing I found myself talking about quite often um with authors is how how hard it is to, to make it in this career. Often you can find yourself um, forcing yourself into particular venues because you think they'll be more marketable or you'll be able to get them done faster. Um, and I do think there is a balance for that, you know, some wisdom on that. However, um, because writing is a career where it's kind of hard to make it in, uh, it's one of those things where, like, if you're going to be pursuing a route which you don't enjoy you're just going to end up doing the same thing you're doing right now you know if you're working a career you don't enjoy working really really hard doing something you don't like making less money for it so if you're going to be working really hard to do something you don't like then you know find a job where you can do it finish it for the day and go home and watch <laughs> tv instead of being an author <laughs> because I'll just say I don't very often go home and watch TV. That's not what I do on my nights. Um, so yeah, I think there is there's a lot of importance on that. Um, it is it's a lot of work. So um, I think like another on a more positive note of that though, uh, I think that readers can recognize when you are really enjoying what you're writing uh, and when you're passionate about something. And it's easier to find the readers that you connect with, for one, because you're not just trying to find, you know, where the most popular books are selling, but you are connecting with people who love the same things that you love or are passionate about the same things you're passionate about. Um, it's more fulfilling work because you're doing something that you feel is important in the world. So when you hit those moments where you're like, yeah, I don't know if I want to keep doing this. This is a lot of work for no reward. Like it can be easy to hit those those places as an author. Um, but being able to to do it about something you're passionate about 
you can fix your perspective and be like, hey, even if one person is impacted by my work, it's important. Versus being like, oh, I'm going to write a vampire romance because that's what's popular right now. And hating yourself the whole way through <laughs> and hating what you're writing and and not making any money at it. And, you know, what exactly do you hold on to when you get to that point? So, um, so yeah, I think, you know, when you're writing something you're passionate about, your readers are going to enjoy your work more because of that. They're going to connect to your work more and they're going to connect to you more. And that will make that your writing and your career more, um, more valuable and worth your time. Yeah. Even if you're not making money off of it. <laughs> I'll just verify with that. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that our writing just is better when you're passionate about it. Um, I think that's one of the reasons I enjoy so many PFW books because I know that everybody here is writing things that they just really enjoy or they really think is important. Um, and I think that really does come through. And then like Joel said, it makes your writing more enjoyable. Um, and because you're enjoying it more, the output is better. I think we see that a lot in pretty much every field. If you don't like what you're doing, then what your, your output is just not going to be very good. You can tell. Like you don't enjoy it, so you don't work as hard. Um, and it's a problem. And it happens in the writing world just like every other career. Um, so if you want your writing to be good, then it's important that you actually enjoy what it is that you're writing. Um, and then on top of that, it brings you closer to your readers, as Jill mentioned, and they are more likely to remember you um, if you are writing about something that you're passionate about because it comes through. They're going to notice the passion. Um, it might be a match for something that they are also passionate about and so they're going to remember oh this person writes about a thing that I also care about and I can tell this author cares about it so I'm going to come back and I'm going to read more from them um, so it does allow for um, quality connections with your readers and it makes your writing just overall more memorable definitely agree with those points for me personally if I'm writing something that I'm not as passionate about, or it's mandatory, you know, flashback to too many college essays that I don't <laughs> remember. Um, you know, I found that, okay, it's taking me a lot longer to write this than it, it should, and the words weren't coming as easy, the writing quality wasn't as good. I mean, even looking back, it's like, I could tell that I, my art wasn't into this, and, you know, I'm sure readers would be able to tell, too, if any of them saw my college essays, that's not happening. Don't get any crazy <laughs> ideas. <laughs> Um, but when it comes to writing things I'm passionate about, such as faith or technology, words typically come easier. I'm more absorbed in it. I'm less likely to be distracted by Twitter or other social media posts when I'm really in the zone. And I mean, it's not like you don't struggle while writing something you're passionate about. I mean, there's still research. There's still having to write it all out. There's still editing. There's still the infamous marketing. <laughs> But, I mean, just having something that you're passionate about writing, it gives you purpose and it gives you a reason for doing it, especially when it's in the not as fun phases of writing. And, you know, readers will be able to tell whether what you're writing is something you're passionate about or not. And even, you know, say worst case, somebody doesn't like what they read from you. I mean, at least they'll be able to see, okay, I might not like it, but I could tell that they put their heart and soul into it. There was definitely work done. I can at least respect them for putting that much effort in. Yes. Yeah. One interesting thing whenever I have this conversation with people, a lot of people are on board with putting their passions into their story, but um, sometimes they think, I have too many. I'm interested in too many things. How do I handle this? So I was wondering, how do we go about incorporating our passions into our stories? Because I know the three of us are like passionate about a lot of different things. Um, so how do we go about putting those in? Let's see. I guess for me, I focus on a couple of core passions. And then whenever I can, I slip in some of my lesser passions. Not to say I'm less passionate about it, but it's not the main focus. So you know, two things I put into my writing a lot are usually, you know, faith. I'm a Christian specific author, so I usually put in a lot of elements of you know, faith, hope, perseverance for a lot of the themes. I do include some allegorical element, elements, so there are instances where it's like, okay, this is definitely a Jesus character, or this is definitely a Satan character. But it's like, I also make sure that they are grounded. It's not just like, okay, we're inserting these just for inserting, you know, faith into a story. It's like, okay, how does this, these, how do these elements drive the characters? How do these elements drive, drive the plot? It's like, 
the passion of my faith and the story, they work together. It's not just like slapping one on for the sake of the other. And then for technology, so I'm a software engineer. That's my day job. And I have a passion for technology. And, you know, being in that field, it gives me an idea of, okay, AI is becoming more prevalent of a theme. And that's becoming more prevalent both in my work and in kind of mainstream media. So it's like, okay, how can I incorporate those elements into a story? And even just being in that environment, it gives me so many different ideas for tech world building. So, you know, like the watches and two live street choices, that definitely came from my passion for technology. So those were always fun ideas to have. And then, you know, sometimes I can squeeze in. So I do like language. So sometimes I focus on specific name meanings for characters and have that be little Easter eggs for people who like looking up names or you know, try to base words off of Latin or sometimes Norwegian words because I am Norwegian. So just little things here and there that I try to slip in. Yeah, I, it's very hard for me to be able to pick out anything in particular because I feel like almost everything that I do comes up, comes from a passion that I have. I think even those things that I'm like, oh yeah, this is just for marketing. Like, we'll see how that goes. Um, are things that I'm excited about personally. So things like the audiobooks, or I recently, um, for my giveaways, uh, commissioned uh, scented candles, which, yes, on the one hand, it's like really exciting. My marketing opportunity, on the other hand, is just really cool. <laughs> um, so, you know, things like that. Um, so I think a lot of the stuff that I'm most passionate about comes about in my themes. And uh, so I write two main genres at the moment. Um, and while I do dabble around in fantasy, I don't really consider myself a fantasy author at the moment. Um, so I'm really interested in science um, and in genetics and, and basically anything because I'm a huge nerd. <laughs> so uh, I really love playing around with cyberpunk and, and biopunk genres because not only does that give me a chance to work with some hard science fiction um, and to actually incorporate some real science and some stuff that I'm excited about. But it's also for me um, a really pull, pulls in um, theology, philosophy, and then these core questions that are uh, specific to the genre that I really love. So one thing that cyberpunk and biopunk addresses a lot is kind of where the line begins for humanity, what makes a human. Um, so, you know, if, if you start messing around with genes, is the product of that still human and how far can you go before it's not human? Or if you start messing around with technology and AI, when does that become human? When is it not human? Um, the question of personhood. So it, it allows me, and for anyone who does follow me, my, um, my kind of tagline is exploratory fiction because my desire is to ask questions and to keep digging deeper and to explore these themes through fiction. So I don't expect I'm going to be moving on from those questions in cyberpunk anytime soon, not just because they're so core to the genre itself, but also because they're so core to questions I have about myself and about the world um, and to things that I'm passionate about. Um, in the real world, things that I've experienced and things that I've seen that make me want to delve into these things a little bit more and ask those questions of the people around me. Uh, the other genre that I play around with a lot is horror, specifically gothic horror. And gothic horror is, um, or gothic fiction is, in general, is very, very good for playing with themes and theology and philosophy and questions about spirituality. Um, because it's so focused on themes and on layering different meanings. So you have, you know, the, the spooky story with the pretty settings and stuff like that. But then underneath that, you have just so many layers of questions about life and death, about morality, 
about um, what it means to connect to other people and trust other people and how much damage and pain love can do and why love is so worth it in the end. There's so many questions that Gothic and Gothic core brings up when dealing with these things. And I think the, the more I live my life and the more I experience things like death and pain and suffering and, and questions of meaning and why are we here, the more I want to play with those things in fiction and ask those questions of myself and of my readers and not just be like, okay, look, here's the answer um, because we don't know the answer. We have, you know, as a Christian, I believe what the Bible says and the Bible states, but at the same time, the Bible is living and breathing, and I'm never going to fully know it. I'm always going to be um, competing with my own humanity in order to understand it more. So being able to um, to explore those things in fiction and to dig deeply into them in themes um, are really important to me. Um, for now, I haven't been able to dig too deep into it with my platform. Uh, I have plans in the future of how to be able to to bring those things not into not just in impacting my readers and my readers like encouraging their their minds to explore these things, but I also want to be able to use my platform a little bit more effectively to um, to impact the things that I'm passionate about here in the everyday life. Um, dealing with issues like human trafficking and, and whatnot. Um, but so far, I haven't been able to do that much. But I do have an eye for that in the future. And I do think that's important to, to think about as an author, especially if you're a Christian author, of how your art is going to relate to your life in the everyday world, your relationship with your church, your relationship with the people around you. Um, so, yeah, those are kind of just a few of the ways. Like I said, it's hard to pick out specific ones because – it's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and what I was thinking is so cool about what both of you said was that I've noticed readers pick up on those things. So like Kirsten, I know in a lot of your reviews, people always mention the watch because they think it's so cool. And I think that's great because you love technology. And so you like clearly put your passion into that and then readers picked up on it. Um, and then Jill, I know I personally was originally attracted to your writing because of your themes of personhood, um, which is something I'm also very interested in. Um, and that came through so strongly in your stories. I thought, oh, I like this author. And then that, we kind of went from there. Um, so I do think that kind of goes to show how important it is to make sure that you're instilling that in your writing. Um, yeah, but for me personally, I think... Yeah, I am interested in a lot of things, so it's hard to narrow it down, but I think a lot of things that consistently show up in my stories are disability representation, um, because I know words are powerful, and getting to see yourself represented in stories um, really can be a game changer for a lot of people, and unfortunately, disability representation is not common in fiction, um, so I'm really passionate about changing that and kind of challenging how people see disabilities and um, kind of gently asking people to be a little bit more aware of those concepts. Um, and then my world building often involves scientific concepts because I love science um, and I am a scientist myself. I'm a nutritionist and uh, going into nutrient metabolism. Um, and then beyond that, like human rights kind of pop up quite a bit in my stories as well because that's important to me. And a lot of my themes center around perseverance and faith because those two things have gotten me through a lot. Um, and so I'm always happy to kind of share that in my own writing in the hopes that that will help other people. Um, and then, you know, other things, little things, like I enjoy cultural representation, um, because I come from a family background that's very, uh, mixed and we don't belong to any particular ethnicity or race. And so it makes me interested in like all the cultures because I have a lot of those in my family. Um, and so I like to see, similar to disability representation, I like to see other cultures represented because it's always sad when we see consistently the same people represented and consistently the same people underrepresented because I think it makes stories just less interesting and less colorful um and then as far as like platforms go I donate 10 percent of my earnings to a disability ministry called Johnny and Friends and also 10 percent um to a safe house for survivors of sex trafficking which is called Letitia's house and then I partner with Beth Wangler each year to do Dress Summer, which raises funds um, for victims of sex trafficking and survivors of uh, sex trafficking. 
Um, and then I use my social media platform to talk about different things relating to disability. Um, so I think there are a lot of ways that writers can go about putting their passions into stories. It doesn't have to be just their social media or just their stories. You can kind of mix them all together. Um, as long as it's kind of something that is woven into your stories and your platform and comes about naturally, uh, which if you are passionate, then it will happen naturally. I think um, it's kind of a cool thing to do. I'm always drawn to writers who do that. And I think readers are too, because like we mentioned earlier, it just makes you more authentic. And I think readers are drawn to that. Um, at least I am. So, uh. Next question. Um, how do we recommend going about weaving personal interests into stories? Um, I just talked for a really long time. So Jill, do you want to take that? And then we'll loop back to me in a second. <laughs> Sounds good. I don't mind going. <laughs> um, so I think subtlety is really underrated. Um, and I, I think there's definitely value in having a clearer story. I know definitely my um, my latest short story in the, of Myth and Monsters uh, anthology was a lot less subtle and a lot more um, <laughs> blatant in its themes and, and almost allegorical at some points. So I do see the value in those things, definitely. Um, but I do think that subtlety is is really um, important when we're trying to get across our themes because I do think there is a danger in, in um, preaching too much. Mm -hmm. um, especially, I think, one thing that I've mentioned before as a Christian, when it comes to Christian fiction, I do think that it can be dangerous to try and take the place of a preacher when you're writing fiction and try to make the gospel more palatable because um, the gospel doesn't need to be dumbed down for human beings, doesn't need to be made more palatable, it shouldn't be sugar-coated. Um, but that's, you know, something personal that I'm, um, um, that's something personal that, that I feel quite strongly about. Um, and I do think that it's for each person to kind of decide what that looks like, both in what they're reading and what they're writing. Um, I think that, that we need to recognize as authors that our readers are equal partners in our art. Um, so their imagination completes what we've started in our creati creativity. And if we are too blatant or too obvious and push it too much, we are kind of usurping the role of the reader and we're taking over their part of the story. And I think that can um, it, it can take away a lot from the reader because they don't get to join you in the story with their imaginations if you push it too hard. Um, and I think that it also, it makes it harder for your readers to be able to take those themes and, and those questions and, and messages that you have and to um, it can make it harder for them to relate those to their own lives because when you bring across a specific theme really really hard you're bringing it across for something you're passionate about or the way you think about it um, and how it applies to your life so if you're stealing that that possibility of them to be able to to use their imagination to insert themselves into the story and make it applicable to themselves um, you're going to rob them a lot of the of the impact of your yeah. themes. So I, I think there's a lot of danger in, in pushing too hard. I think Beth Wengler, uh, Wengler reminded me of this um, when I wanted to put more specifics into my story, like I just mentioned, uh, Eyes of the Barkas, um, because that story is so incredibly personal to me, and I felt like people wouldn't understand it. Um, and I, I sometimes still do feel like it, it doesn't quite hold the meaning for other people like it does for me um, because it is so specific and so personal to me. But I think, like, she reminded me that um, that in doing that, I would rob the story of, of the power that it had by trying to force people to understand my mentality of, of how I wrote it and why I wrote it. Um, and I think that for those who do understand the story that is more powerful because I chose not to take those final steps and be like, by the way, this means this, and this means this, and this means this, and that's what this is all about. Um, so yeah, I, I, and I do think there, you know, there's no problem in, in doing that on your own personal platform or if people ask, you know, if people came to me and were like, okay, so what does the broadcast represent? Like, I don't think there's any problem in explaining that a little bit. But I think that they're, especially in your fiction itself, you need to be careful in how, in how hard you push your message, I think. 
Yeah, I agree. I think um, kind of similar. I have two basic ways I go about weaving personal interest into stories. I either pick an interest and then build my story around that. Um, or I pick a story and then kind of keep an eye out for ways my interest can complement that story. Um, I know that when you pick your interest first and then build a story around that, that tends to freak people out because they say, no, you can't do that. It's going to make the story preachy. You're going to ruin it. Um, I don't agree with that. I think that that can happen, but it just means that you're not writing that correctly. And that's more your fault than the method's fault. <laughs> so... Uh, I think that method I use quite a bit, actually. I did, I did that with Skies of Dripping Gold, where I really wanted to focus on the concept of um, the pain that comes from trying to have faith when you feel like you are forgotten. Um, and also, like, with this pain inside, where I wanted to challenge people's view of disability and also kind of delve into what it's like to be a disabled person and trying to, like, reframe what it means to be valuable in a society that values uh, things that... Uh, aren't typical for disabled people. Um, and so I kind of picked the theme first and built the story around it. Um, and I think those stories were just as successful as the ones where I did the opposite, um, where I started a story and then found ways to have my interests infused in there. Um, so like, for instance, when I started writing the Terebinth Tree Chronicles, um, because I grew up on Tolkien, uh, my elves were all the like tall, regal, slender forest elves, because you know, that's, that's the standard. And I love those. That, that's not like a knock on that at all. Um, but later on, I decided to switch it up by making them like Native American inspired desert elves because um, I grew up going on camping trips in the desert. And so I just am really interested in deserts. So I thought that sounds fun. Um, and because I'm interested in cultural representation, uh, the Native American thing kind of came along with it. Um, but then also, I know that some people are shy about doing themes. And I think it's important to note that that's okay, too. Um, sometimes your stories don't have to be that deep when you start building them. Um, Vengeance Hunter, one of my stories, again, started out as, I just really like vampire stories. So I thought, I just want to write a vampire story. It wasn't deep. I just wanted to try it. Um, and then because I'm interested in a bunch of different things, those interests kind of snuck their way into the story. Um, just like my latest anthology story, ha uh, Mistakes Were Made, I just wanted a goofy college story in space. It wasn't supposed to be deep, but it ended up having like themes that I wasn't really expecting, um, but that are very consistent with what I usually write. Um, so sometimes you can just pick things that you like and build out from there, and then your passions are going to kind of sneak in. Uh, and then you just kind of notice that and buff it up a little bit during editing. Yep, and then it was just part of the plan the whole time. Yes. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, for me, it seems like you could, yeah, kind of like what you, you were saying, Hannah, you can kind of go two different ways. For me, it's kind of like you can either go with the more subtle approach with putting your passions in, or you can kind of go really not obvious. Well, I guess obvious, but not preachy. There is a line. Yeah. So, you know, I'm a Christian specific author and, you know, I'm like Jill, I don't want to be, the last thing I want to be is preachy because I do know what it's like to have someone say, okay, this is how it is, go with this. And then I go to the Bible and say, eh, I don't think so. <laughs> so I do like to put in faith elements and I do have allegor uh, allegorical elements as well, but I try to balance it out by saying, okay, how does this advance the story, whether it's through you know, characters or motifs or themes. And I try to focus on that more than explicitly saying faith elements in the work. And if there are cases where a character, you know, has to describe their faith for whatever reason, I try to balance it out with characters that have sli either slightly differing, differing points or really polar opposite viewpoints, because I think it is important to get, you know, all different sides of the perspective. I mean, even among Christians, there's way too many denominations that everybody has different views on different topics. So it's like, well, not everybody's going to have the same beliefs, but that doesn't mean we can't benefit from the differences or benefit from looking at different points. Yes. I'll have probably a sp more specific worldview that I have a more bias to, and that'll probably make it into my writing a little bit because it's hard to avoid putting at least some bias into your writing, especially with faith-based topics. But, you know, it's important to, kind of try to go for a big picture and that's how I kind of try to combine you know more of the subtle elements to 
make it sort of a better big picture as well as kind of the different viewpoints. Hopefully that makes sense. That does. I love that. Um, I think that so often we get caught up in writing what we think other people want. Like we think, oh, this is this is what this is a hot topic right now, or oh, this topic's too difficult, so I'm going to write this one instead because it's more palatable. Um, and I do think that's backwards. I do honestly think that we should be writing what we enjoy um, because then your passions will come through um, and attract readers. I think a classic example of this is Tolkien. Epic fantasy wasn't really that big of a thing, and he just thought, nah, I'm going to do it anyway because I like it. You know, he spent so many years building this entire massive universe. You don't do that unless you're passionate about it. So it was clear that it was a passion project for him. Um, and now we have so many epic fantasy books out there. Um, so I think just find what you like and maybe something will come of it. And even if it doesn't, um, at least your story will have helped a few select people. And I think that's worth it as authors. So something that keeps coming up um, is the topic of going overboard. And I think this happens a lot when authors get really excited about something um, and it just kind of overshadows the overall story. There's a lot of preachiness or info dumping. It's kind of a problem. Um, so how do we recommend avoiding this? I think uh, the most important thing is to remember that the story itself needs to work. And I think there's definitely a difference between a story working or a story being um, realistic or even logical. Like there are a lot of illogical stories that still work. Uh, think of Alice in Wonderland, <laughs> <laughs> which is still around today, even though there's no logic or realism. Um, it can definitely be more important sometimes to sacrifice uh, realism or even sacrifice the story itself for a theme or even for aesthetic. Um, for instance, the other day I was watching Haunting of Hill House with my husband and he was pointing out how, you know, people don't talk like that and that sounds out of place and that, you know, and explaining to him that this is a trope in, in Gothic in particular where it's almost like poetry and prose form. And so they're all going to talk like poets, even though they're not all poets, <laughs> because that's, you know, it may not be realistic. We may not talk like that, but um, that's thematically what needs to happen for the story to be better. Um, I think my personal approach in, in finding balance is that um, I, I try to ask questions rather than giving answers. And there's a few topics in which I'm pretty, I feel pretty strongly about, and I will come out and say in person on my social media, you know, be like, okay, look, I view abortion as murder. There is no if, ands, or buts. I'm not going to hem and haw around this. Um, I may not preach it every time I go on Twitter, but like, I'm not going to be shy about this. Um, however, even when I approach those things in fiction, my my effort is to to trust my readers and trust their intelligence and so to ask questions and and have trust that they will look at those questions and come to the right conclusion you know so if i ask the question why is it okay for this character to kill their child because they don't want it but this character someone else is killing their child and that's evil and murder um because they do want it. Like, what's the difference there? Um, so yeah, I think asking questions rather than just giving a straight answer is often a good route. Um, and I do think uh, I have a tendency, especially in my first drafts, and this is one of the reasons why beta readers, especially beta readers who know you are so important, because I have a tendency to belabor the point. Um, for instance, in the horror that I just finished, I it, it was very important for me to get across this point of the character, um, his change coming after love versus before love. Like he didn't have to change himself for to be loved by his family and to have people who cared about him. But because he had people who loved him and cared about him, he was able to change, be a better person. So when I went about the first draft, it was just like, oh, love, you can feel the love, and there's love and emotion and everyone. And my batteries were just like, um, I feel like I'm swimming in syrup here. Like, can we make it a little <laughs> less sappy? Uh, but it was important for me in those first drafts to be able to kind of go overboard in order to to understand exactly how much I needed or how little I needed. So I think especially in the first drafts, I tend to go overboard. I know that about myself. Um, so I, I know to pick the correct beta readers who will be able to just kind of shoot me down a little bit and let some of the air out of my sails so that I, you know, come back down to earth a little bit. Um, so yeah, I, I think 
those are two methods that work really well for me. Uh, but I do think it's important to know your, your writing style, know yourself as an author. Uh, and that's why writing for so long is so important. You know, you're not going to make it on your first book. You're not going to make it by yourself. You need authors around you who, who know you and care about you. And you need to write a lot. And you need to understand that the first book that you put out there isn't always going to be the best one because it's a learning process. When you understand yourself better and you understand your process better, you understand what works for you, what doesn't work for you, then your writing will get better. And the, um, the way you are able to implement your themes and your passions are going to work better. So that you don't have like insane info dumps like at the beginning of Malfunction where I have three chapters straight talking about genetics and, and, um, and stuff like that. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I do think yeah, it's a process and it's it's important to know yourself. Yeah, definitely. For me, one thing in order to make the story better, like I'm somewhat the opposite of Jill in a way. I tend to be very plot focused. So my first draft is always get the plot down, good. And then if beta readers see it, it's like, okay, you have some work to do on world building or character development. Like we need these characters to be more fleshed out. <laughs> So that's something I'm definitely aware of, and I always need beta readers to help me fill in those gaps because I might have it, I might know everything in my head, but it doesn't make it on paper, or I thought it made it on paper and it didn't because I have way too many drafts before I send it out to beta readers. Way too many drafts. <laughs> um, so kind of like what Jill was saying, it's definitely important to make sure that the story works. And that's really the best way to get your message across because if, you know, if it's just the message and the story's just kind of like the backdrop to bring the message forth, readers will catch on that and all they'll come away with is that it was preaching that the message is not going to actually make it through. So part of my process of making sure my work isn't preachy, since it is more explicitly faith-based typically, is first make sure that the writing is good. So uh, beta readers catch me on the lack of character development and making sure that my world building makes sense and you know that the plot is decent too the pacing is good all that stuff and then the other aspects I have beta readers focus on besides just writing in the those terms is yeah I don't want it to be preachy if I am doing more faith-based elements that's something I really try to ward off against I also try to avoid info dumping because that can get really boring. I love Tolkien, but those nature descriptions, <laughs> I can't tell them giving those every time. Sorry. <laughs> They're great, but yeah, I skip them. <laughs> Same. So, I always just try to focus on like, okay, is this faith element or is this world building element? Are they relevant to the story? Am I going to use them later? If they're not going to be used later, I kind of log them away, not to never be used again, because they might come up in future stories, but it's like, okay, don't need it for this draft. Let's leave it out. And then also, kind of similarly, do these elements help with character development? So, you know, one of my characters is really strong in her faith in Two Lives, Three Choices, and then there's another character who is not. <laughs> so having them kind of have debates, but also making sure that they understand that the other's viewpoint isn't necessarily invalid. It kind of just like, okay, yes, there's a faith base going on. Yes, I am probably biased to one side over the other, but two sides to every story. Let's look at all the different sides, all the different viewpoints, and then the reader can decide for themselves which one they want to go with. So, yeah, because kind of like Jill, I try to focus on, you know, questions that don't have necessarily an easy answer because readers aren't dumb, they have opinions and they can go and do research for themselves and figure out what they want. And you know that kind of allows me to get more nuanced opinions and more nuanced views and allow me to represent those different views in a way that you know isn't disrespectful to any of the views at all. So just kind of make sure that all these are represented or at least a lot of them and make sure that whatever I put in is relevant to where the story is going. Yeah, I love that. I think the important, it's so important to show multiple angles um, 
And I do really like that about when stories do that because then I never feel like the author's trying to force something on me. I think, okay, well, they're just giving me all these things and <laughs> I can use my own brain and the author isn't like patronizing me in any way. Um, so that's always really nice. And it is, um, too, I think if as an author you're struggling with thinking that you might be over preaching or over representing one side, a thing that I found helpful is if you actually make the character, your main character, one that is following. Um, something that you don't necessarily agree with. So you can have the main character representing an angle that isn't really the one that you're trying uh, to promote or the one that uh, you personally believe in. Because I think that does add a lot of extra depth to a story and it does help kind of head off any of that preachiness. Um, obviously not always necessary, but I think that's kind of an interesting trick. Um, and yeah, I did want to reiterate the whole importance of making sure that something fits in a story. Um, I think that while it is important to be passionate, you shouldn't ever be going overboard with it. So I think class, well, maybe not classic examples of this, but one example that's more recent is the book Ready Player One. Um, I don't know if anybody read that. If you did, like, I'm so sorry. Um, no, I'm kidding. Some people liked it. It's fine. But it, the guy clearly loved the 80s. And so he put so many 80s references and he would over explain them. Like he would explain so many of these 80s references and I think, okay, I get it. You like the eddies, but like this is, you just had a whole page on what a DeLorean is. I don't feel that that was necessary for the story. Um, or as Kirsten mentions, um, the long nature descriptions in Tolkien. He clearly loved trees. That's cool. Like good for him. But also there were points where it wasn't really moving the story along or contributing anything to the characters. And that becomes a problem. Just like something you see a lot in sci-fi of like, uh, the technology being severely overexplained, and you think, okay, well, that's cool, maybe if you happen to like technology, but if you don't, then like you just lost the interest of so many readers, and it didn't actually do anything for the story or the characters. Um, so it's really important to make sure that your interests are moving the story along, um, and also that they fit the tone of the story. I think like The Martian is a really good example of this. The science is very accurate, um, but the story itself has a really funny tone. And so he's describing all of these really hard scientific concepts, but it's sarcastic and it's funny and it fits the story perfectly. And it's actually, it's brilliant. I love it. Um, so if you can find a way to make sure that your interests are actually like identically matching um, what it is that you're, uh, like the tone of your story, I think that helps a lot. Um, and then also it's really important to note, um, just don't force anything. I think I mentioned earlier, I'm really... Uh, I try to put disabled characters in all of my stories, um, but when I was writing Vengeance Hunter, it just didn't fit. I couldn't find a place for it, and I really, I was upset. I really wanted a disabled character in there, so I tried so hard to, like, shoehorn one in, and I did it, and it, the story was not good, because it just didn't fit. It was, there was too many things going on, um, and so I ended up cutting that character, and the story was better because of it. So I think even if there is something that you're really passionate about, sometimes you do have to kill your darlings. Um, so if you come to the conclusion that this thing is making your story worse, then you're just going to have to cut it. And that's okay. You can get it in your next story, maybe. Um, so don't like try to hinge too much on any one story um, because you're going to be writing other ones. So if you didn't get that one particular passion in this time, you can get it the next time around. It's okay. <laughs> So I think that is it for um, passion and writing. Uh, so let's talk about book club. What's everybody reading this month? So uh, I've not had a lot of time to read in October. Um, as I explained, it's been a little bit nuts. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've consistently been kind of focusing on audiobooks. So I just more or less finished Goblet of Fire. I had to finish, like return it like you know, 20 minutes from the end. So I pretty much finished it. Um, and then, um, so now I, I've been reading, well, listening to uh, Hidden Figures, an audiobook, finishing that up. And then I'm also reading Turn of the Screw by Henry James um, with my Discord. So, uh, so that's been interesting. I haven't gotten as far into it as I wanted to, but I kind of read it and react on my Discord um, and kind of leave a thread of, of what I've been reading. So um, so that's been going on. I have like a ton of things, like books that I've been slowly fighting away at over the course of the year that just haven't happened so much in October. So Yeah, well, you're reading more than me, so you can feel accomplished. Um, I've read nothing this month except like 
academic articles and massive textbooks on metabolism and clinical nutrition. Uh, yeah, which I don't really count because it's not fiction and it's as much as I enjoy it, it's not the same. So that that's what I've been reading. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm kind of in the middle. I've only been kind of reading The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde for Author Book Club. I'm not very far on that. I need to get on that. So I'm kind of in between Anna and Jill right now. Nice. Well, maybe we'll get it next month or not. It's fine. Um, yeah, so that's it for our podcast. Um, but you can find all the PFW writers on our website at phoenixfictionwriters.com. And we're also on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook as at PFW Books. Um, and then this podcast is on iTunes and YouTube and Google Play and Spotify. Um, so if you could give us a follow, a thumbs up, leave us a review on iTunes, whatever you could do, it's really appreciated. Um, and then also come say hi to us personally on social media. Um, I'm on Twitter at underscore Hannah Heath. And you can find me on my website at hannahheathwriter.com. Um, and I always enjoy hearing from other readers and writers, so reach out. Um, Jill, where can people find you? Yeah, so you can find me at J.E. Prezi on most social media, uh, including Twitter, uh, Facebook. Um, I think my Instagram is J. Um, But you can find links to all those things at www.jillaneprezi.com. And that will also include links to a whole bunch of other things, including my Discord and my coffee, which is mostly where I hang out these days. Okay, and then you can find me at KL Pierce Books, and that's my handle for you know, a variety of social media, mainly Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And then you can, my website is www.klpiercebooks.com. And there's, I think there's a couple other social media links you can find there as well, as well as some fun little goodies. Yes. So be sure to go say hi to them. Um, also, we would love to hear from you in the comment section. So if you have things that you're particularly interested or passionate about, we'd love to hear how you're working that into your writing or your writing platform. Uh, so leave a comment below. Um, also, fun fact, for November, our podcast is Writing Lessons Learned from Doctor Who. Um, so speaking of passions, Cal Robert Schultz and Beth Langler are huge Doctor Who fans. So they're going to be discussing that with a special guest um, who we will be announcing in our newsletter, I believe. So keep an eye out for that because that's going to be a fun discussion. Um, but yeah, we will then see you next month. And thank you to Jill and Kirsten for coming and chatting with me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.